Okay, hello and welcome to the session Protected Areas in a Post-COVID World. This session is organized by Giancarlo Rodriguez and myself, Ina Lehmann. We are both biodiversity governance researchers at the German Development Institute. Together with our panelists, we would like to take you, our audience, on a journey that we hope will be as insightful as action-oriented. Throughout, we will engage you in the discussion by offering you some questions and by giving you the opportunity to ask speakers your questions. We will begin with a brief introduction to the issues at stake regarding protected areas in the COVID-19 pandemic. We will take this as a springboard for our digital roundtable, which brings together protected areas experts from diverse backgrounds to discuss the challenges the pandemic poses to the governance of protected areas, as well as potential solutions. While I will give our panelists, uh, while I will guide our panelists throughout the discussion, Giancarlo will listen carefully and collect the various solutions that come up during the session. I will then hand over to him to share a systematic overview of the key ways forward. After that, we will also give you the opportunity to direct your questions to the panelists in the Q&A section. Please type your questions and comments in the Woover chat box. And it would be great if you could identify yourself and your institution so that we know who we are communicating with. We will close with a brief outlook on next steps. Finally, you're very welcome to tweet while you're listening. The hashtag for the conference is GLF Biodiversity and um, the Twitter handles of us and our panelists are displayed here. So what is at stake? Why do we devote an entire session to protected areas under COVID-19 conditions? To understand this, we need to take a step back and look at the origins of the pandemic. At the surface, it has emerged due to a virus spillover from white animal to humans at a so-called wet market in Wuhan, China. Once humans had contracted it, it spread across the world. Yet, digging a bit deeper, science tells us that such zoonotic diseases are indeed a growing threat as humans destroy ecosystems and traffic wild animals. In unbalanced ecosystems, more robust species, which are more likely to carry dangerous viruses, spread and endure more easily. And with increasing contacts between humans and wild animals, the likelihood of human contagion grows. Conservation must therefore take center stage in the crisis response strategy. Traditionally, protected areas are a cornerstone of conservation strategies. Yet they are not uncontested, particularly in the global south, because the establishment protected of protected areas has frequently promoted the separation between humans and nature, often leading to forced evictions and violations of local people's cultural and economic rights. Yet the zoonotic origins of COVID-19 have led some to support a stricter separation between spaces for humans and wildlife. That said, well-managed protected areas are known to have beneficial effects for conservation. However, protected areas themselves are not immune against the negative effects of the pandemic. Rather, as people without social protection lose jobs due to lockdowns and look for alternative ways to meet their livelihood needs, and as countries seek ways to rebuild their economies after the crisis, um, pressure on protected areas, natural resources grows. With drops in international nature-based tourism, moreover, um, funding for protected areas management is lacking and declining in many countries. It is thus very timely to discuss recent challenges in relation to protected areas, especially as we are heading towards major conservation events where protected areas will be high on the agenda, notably the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, the next IUCN World Conservation Congress, and the 15th Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity. Indeed, we hope that we will be able to feed some of the policy recommendations from this session into these policy processes. With that, let me now introduce our panel, and I would like to ask all speakers to switch their cameras on for this. Um, so first, we have Marcella Fernandez, who is a leader of the indigenous Cabecur community in the Talamanca rainforest of Costa Rica. She cannot be with us today, but she sent us a video message in which she provides us 
with first-hand local insights of the impacts of the pandemic on people and environment in protected areas. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Herbert List, who is Senior Vice President of Global Public Partnerships and Senior Vice President and Managing Director of Conservation International Europe. In this position, he has been leading government engagement and corporate partnerships in Europe for the past years. Herbert, I'm very curious to learn from you about the conservation community's view on the COVID-19 pandemic. Next, we have Adrian Martin, who is Professor of Environment and Development at the University of East Anglia, UK. Moreover, he's Director of the University's Global Environmental Justice Research Group, and he has extensive research, uh, interdisciplinary research experience regarding the social impacts of natural resource management in many countries of the Global South. We are very glad to have you here today, Adrian. Finally, we are very happy that with Anna Spansley, we have a renowned tourism expert on our panel. She has worked on sustainable tourism for several international agencies. And notably, she's a funding member and board member of the Global Sustainable Tourism Council and the chair of the IUCN Protected Area Specialist Groups. Welcome to you, Anna. Yet, before we start the panel discussion, we would first like to learn a bit more about you, our audience, and your experiences with protected areas during the pandemic and your views of the problem. We do this through Slido and it's pretty easy to handle. You can use your mobile phone, tablet or laptop. And please just go to the website displayed here, enter the event code GLF Biodiversity and choose the session room German Development Institute. I will ask you a few polling questions and give you a few seconds to answer each one. The results will appear on screen so that everybody can see them. So here comes the first question, and that is, um, which in which country are you based? So we just want to get an idea of who you are and where you are from. And the second question then will be relating to your experiences. So how often have you been to protected areas since the outbreak of the pandemic? And third, we will ask you, so what, in your view, what is the number one challenge in relation to COVID-19 and protected areas? And if you've already entered the Slido form, you would see that there are options for answering. And yeah, so let's start and see what people are responding. Okay, answers are coming in. You see many people from Germany, from the Philippines, which is great. Rwanda, Italy. Mm -hmm. Still someone else coming in? Anybody else wanting to answer? Okay, so what we see is, ah yes, more answers are coming in. So we have an audience from around the world, from Australia, over Rwanda to Colombia, Philippines, Indonesia, and yeah, many people from Europe, obviously. This is great. So let's see the next question. How often have you been to protected areas? If you start polling now. Okay. So, so far we see that they don't seem to be your refuge in times of lockdown. If anybody else that wants to answer the question, please just type in. If not, we will soon switch to the next question. And so we're curious to learn about how you view the problem. This is just about your intuition. So it's not like you need to um, have a very profound knowledge on the issue, but just to get an idea of what your sense of the problem is. Okay, so we have two answers so far, four answers. Okay. Oh, yeah. So quite a diverse understanding of the problem, which is interesting. Okay, tourism, logging. Okay, so it's also more quite evenly spread among lack of tourism, 
illegal logging? Many people say they don't know. Oh. Okay, so in any case, tourism always as is at the top of the perceived problems or the lack of tourism. We will see in the discussion and how our panelists will see that. And it's great, of course, if people are so concerned about tourism that we have Anna on board, who will surely be able to tell us a bit more about tourism and protected areas. And then, yeah, logging and exclusionary discourses are also perceived as major problems. And of course, yeah, communities getting sick to cover it. Um, so that I think is a good um, point, maybe this last one about communities. So with this, let's now delve into the discussion and we will start with Marcella's video message to hear from her how a community in Costa Rica has dealt with the pandemic. Marcela Fernández Fernández, soy indígena de Costa Rica. Yo le voy a hablar un poquito cómo la pandemia ha afectado a los territorios indígenas. Este, esta pandemia que ha llegado a nuestro país hace siete meses sí nos ha afectado de manera, este, de manera eh, bastante. Eh, no estamos acostumbrados, pero ya y tuvimos que enfrentar serias, serias cosas que no estamos esperando. Pero a través de esto, pues como familia, eh, este, hemos organizado un grupo de, de mujeres que hemos trabajado en el tema del estanco indígena de trueque virtual, donde hemos desarrollado esa nueva tecnología para no aglomerar personas ni gente que, que se aglomeren para, para no traer el contagio comunitario a la comunidad. Por lo tanto, este, se hizo eso a través de, de, de mujeres en diferentes comunidades para que cada mujer de, esa persona, cada mujer de la comunidad pudiera informar a, a nivel virtual a un teléfono a la organización que estaba de base. Por lo tanto, nosotros como mujeres este, tuvimos que implementar esto y continuar con la seguridad alimentaria de la familia también a través de, del conocimiento tradicional en lo que es producción. Y ahí desarrollamos las, las cinco categorías de la producción tradicional que hemos venido trabajando. Es un conocimiento ancestral este, que se ha venido desarrollando ante esta pandemia y de ahí se ha creado lo que es el grupo WhatsApp se ha trabajado llevando la alimentación para las familias en todo el territorio. Se ha este, desarrollado proyectos importantes como es la alimentación, como es también este, la parte de la semilla. Y eso ha, ha garantizado más que todo la seguridad alimentaria de la familia. Este, con la naturaleza pues no nos ha perjudicado, más bien ha sido más fuerte. Nuestra, nuestra naturaleza este, se ha visto mejor porque hemos implementado ese, esa, esa cinco categorías de la producción tradicional, eso fortalece más a todos los que es nuestros recursos naturales y además este, hemos también protegido lo que es este, la parte de la medicina tradicional. Nosotros como pueblos indígenas pues nos sentimos ante esto que sí es importante trabajar y continuar con el estanco indígena porque aunque la pandemia esté o la pandemia se vaya, quedará muchas secuelas que enfrentar y tenemos que seguir adelante trabajando, garantizándole la alimentación a la familia y, y así, a este, ¿cómo se llama? Poder también tener una buena alimentación saludable sin con, contaminar el medio ambiente y también de la mano con, con lo que todo tiene que ver con nuestros recursos naturales. Esto también, ¿cómo, cómo poder que que nos perjudiquen en las, en las áreas protegidas que tenemos, no nos va a perjudicar, sino que lo que creemos es que se debe fortalecer más a las organizaciones de bases de comunitarias y se debe de, de implementar más prácticas y saberes ancestrales. So, now that we've heard about Marcela's local perspective on the pandemic, I would like all other panelists to, to put their videos on and so that we can have a real panel discussion. And I would like to ask them from their more bird's eye perspective, what they perceive as the number one challenge for protected areas in the pandemic. And um, I would like actually to start with you, Herbert, if you and Avian can also put their cameras on and to give us your view of just 
briefly, what is the number one challenge to protected areas? Yeah, our cameras are blocked, Tina. Yeah, that's the problem. So um, if somebody could unblock the cameras, then I'm happy to sort of share my, yeah. So this should be better. Yeah, wonderful. Now we have you. Yeah. So, I mean, that was a fabulous sort of introduction. And I think the sort of the, 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 the video from, from our colleague um, sort of settles a lot of the issues for us. I think at a very high level, I think, you know, we see temporary losses. And I mean, the first thing that we need to do is sort of reverse dose. Um, but also, I think this is a moment where we can actually use the fact that people realize that planetary health and personal health are so interconnected to actually sort of address the sort of longer standing sort of imbalance between uh, biodiversity and biodiversity loss. Um, that obviously has to be done with, in consultation with, um, you know, in, 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 in the right way, in the sense that um, it's easy for us to sort of say out of Belgium, Australia, Denmark, all of those places uh, that protected areas are important. If we don't take the reality on the ground and the reality for the people there into consideration, then more than uh, not, we actually make mistakes in the way that we implement it. So doing it carefully um, and doing it in the right way is important. But in the short term, just sort of reversing the temporary losses in the right in the longer term, setting an ambitious numeric goal for conservation is, is the way to go. Thank you, Herbert. And I think I will just pass it on to Anna. Thank you, Anna. Um, for me, um, it really the challenge is the systematic nature of the collapse of nature-based tourism. Um, and that, that's my field, so this the side I'm coming from. Um, and I think previously we were really aware of tourism value chains and the multitude of products and services that tourism touches. But it's only once the protected areas closed and travel restrictions and lockdowns prevented tourist visiting that we really understood the levels of reliance and interconnectedness of the industry. And critically, I think we need to ensure the survival of the tourism businesses because of the livelihoods and conservation efforts that they support. So in Africa, for example, um, nature-based tourism businesses have seen their clients decline by between 63 and 86% on average. And future bookings have declined by 70 to 72% on average in April and March this year compared with the last year. This is according to various surveys being taken on the continent. And the revenue losses that the companies have felt have been compounded by insurance um, who have been unwilling to pay business counter um, interruption claims. And also um, agents in Europe particularly refusing to pay non-refundable deposits to um, suppliers in developing countries. Most safari lodges expect to be out of business by the end of 2020 if international tourism doesn't recover. And this has massive implications for conservation financing and also for the local livelihoods that depend on protected area tourism. Thank you. Thank you for this introductory statement. And so I now pass this introductory question on to Adrian. Thank you, Ina. Um, yeah, no, no, and, and uh, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I just want to make a sort of distinction, I think, between short term and long term, which Herbert did also, um, that in the midst of a crisis, uh, one of the major challenges is actually seeing the big picture and seeing the long term picture. So of course, it's absolutely critical and, and the audience has sort of highlighted these as some of the key challenges to deal with some of the, the sort of immediate economic effects which are occurring, including the loss of tourism income, uh, the fact that local people are losing their jobs in towns and having to return to villages and, and put greater demand on, on local resources and, and so on and so forth. So there's that. But I, I think that there is a, you know, we have to avoid a, a, a sort of response which is purely a short term one. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the bigger picture that we should be seeing is a, is a deeper and a, a sort of continuation of a challenge to this 
sort of model of protected areas, which has dominated arguably too much, which may be highly fit for purpose in some locations, but is less fit for purpose in other locations. And it's interesting to see the, the Costa Rica um, example, which itself kind of challenges in a way that protected area um, model by introducing what, what we might call a, a sort of an alternative area-based conservation model, an OECM perhaps, I mean those words weren't used, but where we're introducing um, sort of non-instrumental values for conservation, not being dependent on markets and tourism so much, but being more responsive to traditional knowledge and other ways of valuing and motivating conservation. So I, I think this is the moment when, you know, the challenge for us is yes, to deal with those sort of immediate emergency requirements, but to, to properly rethink um, our dependence on a sort of, on a protected area model, which may not be fit everywhere. Thank you for this. And maybe I can just uh, dig a bit deeper there. And you were talking about many structural issues, long-term issues. Do you see that there's any change in the discourse about protected areas um, now that we are in this COVID crisis? And I'm also asking you as the scientist in the room here who observes protected areas discourses for quite some time, do you see any major changes there? Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure about just because of COVID and, and I sort of, I. I made that I used the sort of word continuation before because I'm thinking that maybe this might accelerate some of the, the changes in discourse which have been occurring anyway in sort of global science policy forums for example where there's much greater emphasis now on ensuring a voice for indigenous peoples and ensuring that um, you know, not, not only, we don't only have this sort of binary between the sort of instrumental and um, intrinsic values of nature. We also listen, we also learn about what, what's called relational values, which are, are, are tend to, you know, is a sort of summary way really of describing a way of valuing nature, which many indigenous peoples um, have. Uh, so, so I think that there's that, and we've also the the whole sort of the OECMs and the recognition of this within the, the CBD and so on is, is another way in which we're embracing uh, alternative models of conservation, which perhaps are less dependent on markets. So such that in a crisis like this, we, we don't just say, well, how can we look to other markets? Uh, it, given a collapse in, in a tourism market, we don't go to the financial sector necessarily. Perhaps we, we also have to go to other ways of understanding the value of conservation and motivating conservation. So, so I, I, I think there has been a shift, a slow one. Maybe COVID is accelerating that. Thank you for this. And um, you were talking also about nature and values of nature and in these days we also often hear the slogan that nature is sending us a message and um, I'm asking you as the conservation uh, conserva conservation Inter conservation international uh, uh, representative here Herbert is is nature sending us a message and some people even say yeah this message needs to be maybe contrary to what Adrian just said that we need a stricter separation between humans and animals, that this zoonotic diseases that are maybe even increasing in future show us that we kind of need to give spaces to wildlife where they are undisturbed by humans. Yeah, I, I think sort of picking up on what Adrian is saying, it's difficult to sort of like posit this as a sort of pure black boy, a sort of pure binary sort of issue. And I think sort of taking into account sort of local circumstances is essential. So uh, there's, there's a risk in sort of taking this an opportunity and sort of painting everything in a black and white sort of uh, scenario. And, and that is not right either. So if we see the impact of the decline of tourism, um, that leads to sort of like, you know, what we notice in places like Kenya, that is what we notice in places like Brazil and, and Colombia, sort of an increase in sort of like um, agricultural grabbing, increase in sort of like illegal uh, in, in poaching. 
Um, so I, I think what we're, we're seeing is that with the link that's now become clearer to a lot of people between uh, impact on protected areas and zoonotic disease, diseases, that there's an opportunity to look at what are the different value systems or the different ways of valuing nature, as Adrian pointed out, that we could look at. Um, you know, it's a pure separation of nature and people is, is in many cases not desirable, is in many cases not realizable. And so I think it is looking at how we can work not only within the protected area, but also in the boundary areas and creating um, ways to value nature in there as well, that leads to an alternative. So if it's pure black and white, um, I think we might be enforcing another decision that we will regret later on and that will not be accepted to many people on the ground. Um, but it's actually, as has been pointed out, is finding alternative ways of valuing nature is the way forward and realizing that, that there's now a direct link between the pandemic or that people more understand the link between a pandemic and nature. It is maybe important sort of both in post COVID recovery um, and um, green new deals to actually value nature within that um, and, and not only look at addressing the economic recession but also sort of valuing nature as a part of the solution. Thank you for this. Uh, I, I, there's one point there where I would like also to dig a bit deeper. You were talking about the boundary areas. Um, what is your take on how yeah, we should deal with these boundary areas? I think that is something that has not been so much in the forefront of the public debate about protected areas. So maybe you can elaborate a bit on that. It's, it, it's, it's, I, I was quite intrigued by the first question you asked in Slido and you get the response and, and um, it's mostly people from Europe and it's mostly people from, you know. Um, I, the, the reality on the ground as my colleagues who are in the field say is, is always a tad more complicated than, than uh, you know, it is, is able to describe at a, on a Zoom meeting or at a scientific conference or at a conservation conference. <clears throat> so I think the experience that we have, for instance, in places like um, San Martin in, in, in Peru is that actually the, in order to realize a protected area, actually a lot of the work needs to be about how do we create value for people who otherwise would encroach on this protected area in, in the sort of boundary areas. Uh, there's, there's no one size fits all. Um, I mean, tourism is whatever we say is, is an important source and has been an important source. The loss of that is, is incredibly important. I think we should also realize that um, a lot of the activities in the boundary and in the protected areas have actually meant that communities could be resolved. So the Red Plus payments that, for instance, communities received in San Martin are actually one of the few ways that have actually made an income and been able to sort of cope with, with the COVID pandemic and crisis. So I think a careful consideration based on local circumstances and obviously with, with, with the local population involved of, of how boundary areas could contribute to uh, taking some of the stressors off of protected areas is important. I mean, I have to leave it at that sort of high level principle, but I think sort of by like digging into the detail uh, in individual cases is, is really important. And we see that the success is that that is actually sort of a, a, a possibility. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think that already was a quite broad answer. And of course, yeah, I, I think this is something that people always say, it all depends on the local circumstances. Um, let me just hand over the word to Anna now for her to respond on this, because I think it's time. Tourism has been ma mentioned very often. So we want to hear your tourism perspective. Anna, please mm -hmm. comment on Herbert. Thank you, um, you know, and um, just following from what um, Herbert was saying, um, in terms of this, this issue, um, the decline of, of tourism has had really substantial and widespread, but also mixed impacts, I think, on conservation. So some of the positive impacts have been included the complete removal of over-tourism from popular destinations that have given ecosystems a chance to recover, um, and also given researchers a chance to go in and, and look at what the impacts have been. 
And then also we've seen lots of examples in the media of marine and terrestrial wildlife and their habitats flourishing and re-emerging into um, areas that have been emptied of people and vehicles. Um, I think we really do though need to rethink about how we plan and manage wildlife tourism in a sustainable way and rethink what practices are acceptable or not. So for example, in Asia, people are saying it's a perfect time to reassess what's working in elephant conservation. So what can be improved? How can captive populations of elephants be better supported for a guaranteed future of all Asian elephants? We also need to reassess the interaction of wildlife of people within tourism to avoid further zoonotic disease transmission. So this includes how close people get to wildlife, whether they feed it or whether they touch it. And particularly true, I think, for primates, um, whether they're mounting gorillas or, or lemurs. And this is because the species are so similar to us, um, to humans genetically, and presumably the risk to us passing them COVID or another zoonotic disease back again is greater than for other types of animals. And we already have systems in place to separate people and nature in protected areas, including we have IUCN protected area categories, we have management systems such as zoning to do this. But it's really um, up to the protected area authorities, um, the managers, and also tourism operators to, to plan and to make it work and to enforce whatever guidance is, is there to shape this visitor interaction safely with nature. Thank you. Thank you for this, Anna. And I think the other point about tourism really is the point of tourism funding for uh, protected areas management. And you already spoke about the decline of um, yeah, tourism and of course the decline of revenues that comes with that. Maybe you can share a bit more of a perspective with us how you see this, um, how much of a problem does this create for protected areas? I know, sorry, sorry. I was sitting on mute, sorry. Um, so we, we've seen as, as the tourism revenues have dropped dramatically that um, during this crisis phase, lots of financial support systems have emerged and they've come in from national governments supporting their own tourism sect, um, industries from donors and also from NGOs. Um, broader support's also been available. So for example, the EU funded IUCN Save Our Species grants and the Biopharma Rapid Response grants um, are offered to the tune of 6 million euro. And in Kenya, $18 million worth of grants have been made available to community conservancies and community scouts. Some conservancies and conservation trusts and also tourism operators have established crowdfunding platforms to raise money and continue the financing, the conservation management and anti-poaching, and also to sustain the communities that have been dependent on tourism and jobs. And there are also investment and facilitation programs in development, including from the IFC and the Luke Hoffman Institute. So there's quite a lot of innovation and thinking going on around um, how to diversify, as, as Adrian said, to ensure that um, these conservation areas aren't just dependent on narrow markets and narrow types of tourism. Um, and I think that when tourism returns and tourism will return, um, it will still have an important play, role to play in conservation financing, but it is important that we don't rely too heavily on it and certainly diversify the types of products and source markets um, and non-market based um, financial resources that can be used. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Anybody of the other panelists wanting to comment on that directly? If not, I will throw out a new question and or actually continue from that because I mean, tourism, obviously we have heard is an important source of funding and people from all around the world come to many protected areas in Africa, in Asia, in South America. But um, of course there has also been, or many people have also criticized to nature-based tourism because um, it may give access to areas where local people cannot access um, or, um, yeah. So I, I was wondering, Adrian and Herbert, to ask you how you see um, the role of protected areas tourism in the future or the future recovery. Will we be able to continue as we did before or will we need structural changes in nature-based tourism? Because the two of you were also talking a lot about structural changes, economic changes that need to be undertaken. And maybe I will give it 
to Adrian first. Ooh, this is a this is a slightly tough one for me in, in a way. I'm not I'm not claiming any any great sort of expertise. I mean, other than you know you know I I would I've seen the the benefits of, of tourism for local communities in places like. Uh, you know, I've worked in Rwanda and Uganda, for example, where mountain gorilla tourism has been transformational in terms of the, the relationships between some local people and their parks. Um, so, so, so I see the sort of, the sort of challenges. Um, at the same time, you know, my, I have a sort of two twofold concern in a way. One is a, a structural model of conservation, which is heavily dependent on finance for, for policing and enforcement. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure that we can get away from that easily, but, but hopefully in a, in a sort of long-term perspective we can, and, and thus we can to some extent um, reduce over time the dependence on tourism income as the sort of primary funding mechanism, you know, or, or even reduce the demand for funding full stop. Perhaps I'm being unrealistic there. Um, and secondly, I, I apologize if this is sort of stepping on the toes of a question that's still to come. I mean, th there is this sort of bigger issue about the fact that we're we're committed to, to a zero carbon world. Um, and, you know, I'm glad that nobody's using the term ecotourism because I think very little of what we're seeing in terms of nature tourism is. Um, so, so I think anyway, um, you know, we, we are, we are in a situation where we have to be discouraging um, long haul flights for tourism in, in the, the next 10, 20 years. Thank you, Adrian. Um, Anne, do you want to re react directly to Adrian? Yeah, just on the um on the, the part about um, the long haul flights and so on there, it is something that the, the, the tourism industry is taking seriously. Um, there are several initiatives that are working directly looking at climate change on tourism and how the sector can operate without fueling global warming. Um, two are the, there's tourism declares a climate emergency, which is there to galvanize tourism professionals to make commitments to reducing their own carbon footprints. And then we have the SunX initiative, which is encouraging tourism destinations and stakeholders to build climate resistance in line with the Paris Agreement through climate friendly travel. Um, I mean, in the short term, and this period, especially um, domestic travel, um, which will take place, will undoubtedly reduce our overall carbon emissions uh, because we can't fly internationally mainly. Um, so options um, are probably going to include more efficient flights coupled with no conference calls like this. Um, there are lots of virtual tools emerging for protected areas and some of them even thinking that it might be a future revenue generating income as well, including for guerrilla tourism, for example, in Rwanda, where the number of people that can go on a trip with guerrillas is limited. But we really need to find innovative solutions, particularly to the climate emergency um, to survive. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And I put, put it on to I'll pass it on to Herbert um, from a conservation organization uh, perspectives. How much of a role do you think should tourism play in the longer run as a source of funding for protected areas? I think it's uh, so tourism is part of the, the overall conundrum is how do we value nature uh, in the right way? And, and I totally agree that tourism is one way of doing that and has negative effects. But I think if we look at it from a need to invest in nature or a need to sort of protect nature. Um, if, if tourism sort of constitutes 850 billion um, in, in, in value, if we lose that, that's uh, a lot less money going to conservation. I totally agree that some of that tourism obviously has negative side effects and not all of it is equally good. But that is, I think tourism will continue to play a role um, together with other forms of valuing nature. Um, I mentioned red plus payments. I think there needs to be a more systematic way to actually value nature that doesn't purely rely on tourism. It's just what we had, I think, in many places and what we sort of used. I believe that we will continue to do that. Um, getting some of the sort of darker edges sort of like, uh, and, and 
and reducing some of the more negative impacts would be good. But I don't think we should um, discard this option moving forward. I think the bigger question is how, as a global community, seeing how much sort of like planetary health sort of impacts personal health, how do we transfer that into um, a, an actual valuation for the nature that we rely on? Thank you. So actually, this kind of also relates to the conference topic, one word, one health, right? So we're talking about health, environmental health and human health issues, of course, and how the two are relinked. And I, um, I was just wondering, as we, how much of a contribution can protected areas really make to um, yeah, keeping environmental and human health in balance? And you already said, or many of you already said, it's also um, about structural issues, about structural changes. But do you see, can you elaborate a bit on where you see the place for protected areas in this broader overall um, mosaic of solutions to keeping nature in better health? So um, what are, what role can protected areas still play? Can I give this to you, Anna? Um, thanks, Ina. Um, so in, in its recent um, essay, the World Commission on Protected Areas recognized um, that the pandemic has really focused the intention of the world on the connection between healthy nature and human health and well-being. Um, it's really highlighted how reliant we are on being outside and on nature for our mental health. So in a, an increasingly urbanized world, the parks uh, can be a gateway to nature for many of the world's population and also can be a natural solution to human health and well-being. Nature can have therapeutic effects for people who are um, suffering from isolation um, and um, the mental health benefits from time spent in nature may also translate into economic benefits such as avoiding um, health care costs. So urban and protect urban parks and protected areas in our country are becoming a real lifeline for our physical and mental health as we try and escape from the lockdowns that we're under. But we have seen some problems with this as well, including with dramatic increased visitation in some protected areas, for example, in Europe, in the USA. Um, and the increased usage and interest could have additional benefits for protected areas um, if we have more uh, protected areas and green spaces more generally. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Anybody wanting to add to this? Maybe. I mean, I, I just sort of I'd like to agree with Anna, really, and just, just say that, you know, it's clear to, to everybody really that this, the lockdown has kind of changed our people's imaginaries in, in some sense and our, the way in which we, we realize that the, the link between our, our well-being and access to nature in some capacity that has been quite overwhelming in some respects just in terms of this you know, you know even to, to the point of you know people wanting to in my country move out of london find places where they can afford a, a house with a garden because suddenly they, they realize that once deprived of that um, your quality of life goes down considerably um, but the, the only other i mean it's a slight sort of um i, I suppose a, a scientific um view not science be honest, but, but just identifying a sort of research gap in a way. I, I think um, there's it, been a, a lot of sort of conservation related work has been packaged as something which um, is good for resilient livelihoods and, and for well-being, um, including, you know, what's now popular talking about sort of nature based solutions to, to many problems. Um, it, it would be nice, and this, this is, you know, COVID does, you know, unfortunately give us the opportunity in a way to, to ask these questions as researchers and find out, you know, is it really true for all of these sort of various projects and so on, which have claimed and have sort of followed the objectives of improving social resilience through nature conservation, has that been achieved? Um, you know, have, have these communities been more resilient? economically and socially to COVID um, as a result of 
nature-based solutions. And I just, I, you know, I can't, so I can't comment on that because I just don't have the evidence. And therefore, to, to some extent, I, I'm slightly reluctant to say going forward what the role of protected areas could be in that as well, or, or other conservation areas. Well, thank you, but I think this is a re really important point for us. I mean, well, I'm, we are, you are based at the university, I'm based at a non-university research institute to really also talk about ways forward for, for research is what do we really need to find out? So I think that's also a very valid point. Um, and I think I would like to touch upon one more issue. I mean, now we've been talking about the good at health healthy effects of protected areas and how they might help us through the pandemic. But of course, um, or maybe not of course, but there's also some fears that protected areas themselves might be threatened due to the pandemic, because in many countries, um, law enforcement might in, in protected areas or in remote areas might be a challenge bec now because um, of lockdowns and because of less protected areas guards being out there and everything. And so there have been some reports about increases in logging, increases in poaching. And I would like to get you back in Herbert as, yeah, from your perspective or from the information that you gather at Conservation International, how much of a problem is this really what we get from media reports about protected areas being a threat due to lockdowns? So I think sort of what we hear from our, our teams in the, in the field is, is obviously that there is both a direct impact from COVID, uh, but also COVID being used as a cover. Um, this is one of the best excuses to actually sort of um, attack um, protection. So I think it's important that we distinguish between the two. Um, I, I gave you the examples of Brazil and Colombia, and it's very clear um, if, if you look at some of the satellite imagery, um, it's, it, it is clear that there's, there's a definite sort of impact on, on conservation areas. Uh, obviously, sort of like the, the, the situation in, in Kenya, particularly northern Kenya, um, you know, loss of sort of income has led to sort of more poaching. Um, you know, bush meat. Some some of that is not is is is, is to address sort of human issues, but some of it is is leading to sort of more illegal wildlife trade. It is going to take a while for us to sort of see the impact um, of, of these measures overall. Anecdotally, what we see in the field is that there's definitely an impact to COVID directly, but also that this is the best excuse to actually roll back some of the achievements that we've had in, in the past. So, um, you know, attention, media attention is important to that. I think pressure from a global community is really important, but also building the capacity of local NGOs to address this and to uh, address this um, is, is, is key. Yes, yeah, so le let me just follow up on the point of global attention, um, because I mean, this maybe might also be understood to be addressed at the audience in this session, and or maybe even tackles up on broader problems of nature uh, and environmental protection. and. Um, this is a bit beyond the core issue of COVID and protected areas, but we have a very strong movement. We have Fridays for Future um, who are putting a lot of pressure on governments to react on climate change, but we are not seeing anything like this in relation to biodiversity loss, in relation to threats to nature. So what makes it so much more difficult to communicate these issues to the broader public and also my impression from following news media on this is that the zoonotic origins of this crisis and how much yeah to come back to an earlier expression nature is sending us a message with this zoonotic disease so it's so much more in the background so what makes it so difficult to mobilize people to act on this Maybe just one more. Oh, Anna, if you want to jump in, please go ahead. Um, I think that in in the past, other zoonotic diseases that we've seen, like SARS and Ebola, have caused illness and death um, for many. But I think this pandemic uh, of COVID-19 is different because it's touched people, whether they're presidents or 
prime ministers or community members across the world. We're all wearing masks, we're all social distancing, um, we're all personally interested in this disease now and how it came about and how we can prevent it in the future. So I think that now more than ever, people are listening to warnings about reducing areas for, protect, for protected areas of habitat encroachment, illegal wildlife trade, and also wet markets. Um, before the, these diseases seemed to be happening to somebody else, but now we all, it's touching us all personally and our families and our friends. We don't want another version of COVID-19 in the future, which might be even worse than this. So we really need to act now. I think that sometimes there's a lack of action because the problem seems to be just too big or too complicated to tackle. But we can really see that individuals, whether it's Sir David Attenborough or Greta Thunberg, each of us can make a difference and we all need to try in our own ways to be more like them. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, thank you. I, I thought those were sort of great points. I think from, from my point of view, um, I think one thing that this is an opportunity and, and you know obviously as, as was just said people are wearing masks people are fearing for their own personal health but I do think it has sort of like changed the way that people perceive nature I think the one thing is and that's what I think a big difference between maybe the biodiversity world and the climate worlds if I can be so bold is in, 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 as in separating those I, I believe that the sort of climate world has done great thing in sort of like making it almost like tangible. Biodiversity is a very complex problem. Climate is an incredibly complex problem. But actually simplifying it down to a numeric goal, as, as much as many scientists hate that, is, has actually helped. Actually sort of, a, it's difficult for people to translate the value of nature into something that they can work on. So the uh, same way as it is, was difficult for people to translate concern for climate into something that they can work on. So. I would say uh, what the biodiversity needs, and that's where the opportunity sort of is, probably with this, this CBD COP that's coming up, is we need a global agreement to the same, that has the same reputation as that Paris Agreement. I mean, people in the street know pretty much what a Paris, the Paris Agreement for climate was. It's pretty impressive how many people in the street can quote an international agreement. So we need the same thing for biodiversity. Um, and then we need clear metrics, something that is actually sort of a rallying cry. Um, it's, it's horrible to say it, and, and I hate to say it in front of a scientist, but simplifying it down to sort of like, you know, maybe one number that people can respond to, I think that galvanizes action. Um, so is it the 30 by 30? We would definitely think that that's the right goal for the CBD corp. Um, but these are the sort of things that we need to do. It's totally, right now is the moment to sort of, sadly enough, use the fact that people realize that nature has a direct impact on themselves to spur this into action. For that, we need a, a treaty, a good treaty, and we need a good goal. Okay, so now we have to hand over the word to Adrian to respond. Okay, yeah, I'll have a go. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, th th there are, you know, movements which do um, call for action on the biodiversity challenge. So, so for Extinction Rebellion, for example, the, the, the call is for climate and ecological emergencies to be dealt with, to be called and dealt with. But then if, if you do go on uh, uh, an XR protest, uh, you'll, you'll soon find that they're, they're calling for climate justice now and not, not biodiversity justice now. So, so, so the point is, is a good one. Um, and, and I think people are sort of, ex we're experiential learners in a way, aren't we? And that, that's that um, in the West, at least, um, the climate crisis is, 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 is tangible in ways that uh, Herbert mentions, not, not just through communication, but because people can actually see and feel that the weather isn't how they remember it, at least. So, so it's that sort of everyday experience. Um, whereas, you know, this, this could be, a, COVID could be a game changer, but, you know, arguably, you know, with the exception of some previous sort of uh, pathogens which have been out there, uh, this is the first time we've, in the West, we've really felt the effects of a, of a biodiversity crisis. Um, but of course, elsewhere in the global south, you know, farmers with um, loss of pollinating insects and so on have been feeling it, you know, on a daily basis in a very tangible way for, for, for a long time. But um, sadly, you know, that those experiences are, are too often excluded or, or not taken seriously enough. 
Um, but I think you know now it has hit. It, it's a uh, it, it's complex, isn't it, about how we react? You know, it's not clear perhaps to everybody. You know. That, does, does what we're experiencing now provide a sort of wake up call that we should be allowing wild nature to be wild nature even more than it is? Or actually, you know, should we be really trying to control nature more? So, so then, you know, it's a sort of ambiguous kind of feeling about how we should respond to, to what we are now experiencing. I mean, and I'm, I'm just, you know, guessing in a way here. I'm not, I have no expertise in this, but these are some of the things which could be affecting the public view. Yeah, well, great for sharing these, well, somehow complex, but still forward-looking thoughts. I think it's it's a good point here, actually, um, to, yeah, briefly come to, um, say, intermediate end of the discussion. I would try to catch up with where Adrian just stopped and ask all of you to give me a, in a, in a one-sentence um, view of how optimistic you are that this pandemic will be the needed game changer for nature conservation. And if you want to, you can also um, give me your answer on a scale from one to there will be no change to five. There will be quite a lot of change. Um, let's start maybe with Anna and then we do Herbert and Adrian. Okay, um, one sentence, yes, okay. Well, I always try and be optimistic. <laughs> um, what I really like is I see agencies collaborating more and more together, um, even in this remote way. Um, we have not all talked together before in this way about these complicated issues and face-to-face -face meetings don't happen. This is a, a cheaper alternative. We can access these from across the globe. People can join in uh, at minimal costs and with almost zero carbon emissions. Um, Excellent examples for tourism include the, the future of tourism, which has grown rapidly to over 300 signatories. Um, we've got the Travelist Coalition with major online travel agencies. For the tourism sector particularly, I think there's a great willingness to collaborate towards the greater good. And I think we just need to move things at speed and not get derailed. Thank you. Super, Herbert. I, I, I think I am quite optimistic um, and sadly enough, it's due to sort of like, you know, horrible circumstances, but I do believe that people are taking action. It might not be as fast and as quick and as systemic as we would like it to be. But uh, from everything that we see, the interest of people who probably in the past did not take biodiversity all that serious and sort of how much that has changed, um, it translates into action, it translates into support, and it translates into people changing their behavior. Uh, the more we can guide that, the better. But I am optimistic, yes. And Adrian? Um, yeah, for, for me, the, the, the transformation that's needed is, is around the sort of the democratization of conservation and, you know, to use a, a term popular at the moment, the decolonization of conservation which have been going on slowly for a long time. And I, I see some signs that uh, COVID is, is perhaps accelerating that. So I'll, I'll give you a sort of thumbs up for being optimistic. Great, thank you. So we have a lot of optimism in the room. Let's hope they are all right in, in the long run. Um, I said we come to an intermediate end now. We, it's not the end of the session, obviously, but we have now heard a lot about the problems, some ideas for solutions, some of them more explicit, some of them more implicit. And as I announced in the introduction to the session, I will now like to hand over to Giancarlo and he will present us what he has identified as the main ways forward while he has been listening over the past 45 minutes. Over to you, Giancarlo. Thank you, Ina. So um, I'm going to try to share my screen. Can is it visible to all of you? Could you give me a sign? Okay. So uh, 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 so the, we have several challenges with respect uh, to protected areas and COVID nineteen. We have the lack of tourism uh, that uh, uh, represent. Uh, decreasing funding for protected areas. We have uh, the challenge of uh, communities um, being sick uh, to COVID-19. We have the issue of uh, 
illegal poaching, uh, illegal logging, the increase of the uh, um, divide between nature and people in, uh, and, and when I say people, I refer to like neighboring communities close to protected areas and the issue of uh, the gasment or the ero uh, eroding of, uh, the, uh, of protected areas. Like all the discussions were uh, quite uh, vibrant and I hope I can uh, manage to, uh, to uh, sum summarize everything uh, in a good way. Uh, there was a complete agreement that we should not only focus on short-term uh, recession uh, solutions, but we should also have the big picture in front with an approach that uh, is not a one side fits all, but that has to be uh, embedded in uh, local realities and local conditions. And I think this is uh, very important to point out. Uh, the first recommendation and the recommendations do not fit one to one to the challenges uh, was around uh, how COVID uh, presents us a window of opportunity to rethink our uh, the dependence of protected areas and markets with respect to, uh, for example, ecotourism. Um, another uh, recommendation was to create alternative ways to value nature uh, in, in a way to not strengthen uh, fortress conservation or the strict divide between people and nature and uh, new ways of uh, promoting alternative tourism. To me, it was not very clear how valuation per se will create this change and this will, we will have to uh, discuss further or uh, uh, discuss it during coffee break, I don't know. Uh, and then this, the next recommendation is uh, rethink what is uh, working good uh, in mainstream conservation approaches and uh, uh, strengthen that uh, in a way that it's not black and white, but a combination of different measures to uh, support protected areas uh, under the crisis that, co that COVID-19 is posing. The next uh, challenge, um, and this refers uh, uh, also to having the big picture of the climate crisis in, in, in mind, is to discourage CO2 intensity, intense tourism by promoting alternative ways of doing tourism. And um, this will also will, uh, need to have some elaboration, but this is uh, just the idea that was um, around the discussion. And the uh, final recommendation uh, was to um, increase and shield existed areas under protection for nature, but also especially for people. And I think that's something that we forgot to uh, mention during the, the, the discussion is that not all people are the same. Like sometimes we talk about uh, neighboring communities. Uh, sometimes we talk about soya farms of cattle ranchers. And uh, I think the um, power asymmetries are very handy to understanding uh, which kind of impact different people have on, on nature. And um, with this, I would like to uh, put uh, uh, these recommendations for consideration. And for that, uh, I will uh, rely again on the Slido thing. Um, we're going to ask the, the audience uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, put stars on uh, each recommendation and to then uh, uh, perhaps point out any, um, any uh, recommendation that, uh, that I miss or that you consider also important. And I will urge you all to go to Slido and, uh, and then fill in the GLF biodiversity uh, hashtag and go to the German, Developers, uh, German Development Institute room and start voting. The first question, it's going to appear soon on the screen. Uh, so we have the, so one, person is voting on the importance of uh, to rethink protected areas and markets dependence. Let's see.
I think the number of answers is stabilizing. So now we go to the next uh, uh, question. How, to, how do you rate policy recommendation on creating alternative values in nature? So I think we can move to the next one. How do you rate, do you rate rethinking what works in mainstream conservation on a scale from one to five? And then the next okay, I think. Move to the next one. And then the last question on the recommendation is to increase and chill protected areas for nature and people. I think that's the last question on the policy recommendations. So I think, and the very last question is, which policy recommendation would you like to add? And so just if you can limit yourself to one word or a very short answer. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> okay. I think uh, there is not so much participation on this one. So, uh, protect nature for its beauty. Ecosystem services improve livelihoods through agriculture, build the capacity. Cannot read them all. Stop disconnecting people from nature by shielding up PAs. I cannot read all the answers right now. Yeah, I think um, 
I think uh, we can uh, slowly move to the to um, to the panelists to comment on the responses. I I I saw that we cannot all see all the things, but maybe you can comment on the general ideas and the responses that you see from the public and point out if I miss something specifically that you would like to point out. And I would like uh, to give the word to Herbert, if you don't mind. Sorry, I'm blanking a little bit. What's, what, what is the question? Sorry. If you can, if you can comment on the answers, and if I miss something on the uh, on the summary that I gave, uh, something that you'd like to highlight. I think sort of, I, I, I think all suggestions that I saw are, are equally valid. I think one of the points that I think one of the previous speakers made that I think is incredibly important is. Um, if, if we're going to not only see this as a short term crisis and address the short term crisis, but change the longer term solution, it means new ways of working together and it means new groups of people working together. Um, I think it is um, something that, you know, a conference like this can make a start, but I'm trying to sort of think how we dire, sort of as, you know, to discuss protected areas in related to a Green New Deal in Europe, how do we relate it to economic recovery? How do we create these, um, you know, valuation models? How do we link it to sustainable tourism? How do we, you know, link it to a change in tourism? All of this requires that are new ways of sort of working together and the more platforms we can build it up, the better. Um, I would hope that a agreement at CBD Corp will actually sort of put biodiversity on the same spot as, as climate and at the same sort of foremost in people's attention, um, that would be a good start to sort of create that platform. Okay. Um, could you uh, maybe elaborate on the way that valuation will make the trick of uh, supporting conservation and protected areas? I think one of the things that sort of, um, I actually mentioned this sort of pandemic prevention coalition. It, it is, interesting if you look at the research comparing the amounts of money that are being put into recoveries whether they're green or, or or not and the actual investment that would be necessary in order for nature to play a pandemic prevention role and to sort of value that um valuation sort of like for many people comes across as a a, a sort of market mechanism and um, um that, that sort of philosophically, a lot of people have philosophical problems with that. But I think we also need to sort of just take to the reality that education is one element, action is one element. But in the end, if we don't sort of like, you know, increase the flows into sort of nature, uh, monetary and valuation wise, that, that we're always gonna fight a losing battle. So I think valuation is an important part of that. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to ask Anna to maybe to react to the results of the polls and maybe to explain a little bit more on the uh, alternative alternative ways of doing tourism. If you if you agree with that policy recommendation, um, I actually was having a technical difficulty seeing the poll from my side. Oh. Uh, maybe it's because I'm far far away from everybody else. I'm not sure. <laughs> probably it takes some time to get there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Um, uh, sorry, what were you asking about alternative forms of tourism? Yeah, if you maybe can explain a little bit more on what are alternatives, uh, alternative ways of doing tourism and how that could support uh, protected areas. Um, well, I think, like I, I said earlier, I think we really need to rethink the way that, that people interact with wildlife. Um, in nature-based tourism experiences. And there are already um, various guidelines on interactions with wildlife. So APTA has, has guidelines for different species, um, whether it's whales and dolphins or gorillas. The Wildlife Friendly Standards um, has produced a, a series of different certifications. Um, so there's a gorilla friendly standards that were developed for um, and have been, been applied in places like Rwanda and are starting in Uganda and, and DRC too. Um, but I think we need to have a rethink about all of these different 
these different systems in light of COVID. So for example, the, the wildlife friendly um, standards for guerrilla tourism already had um, um, provisions for people to wear masks around um, mountain gorillas um, um, before COVID and to make sure that people were 10 meters away um, if they were not wearing masks. But in reality, if you if you go and do one of these tours, it's actually very difficult in a very practical sense to stay that far away from the animals because of the proximity of the habitat, because of the way the sightings are managed and so on. So we need to find a way to match standards and guidelines for, for good practice that we think in theory and from a research basis work well to what's actually going to be able to work when people get into the field and, and use a precautionary principle. Um, if we don't think we can do it safely, rather err on staying further back um, if it's too risky, especially when we have incredibly rare endangered species that, that are under threat. Hmm. Thank you very much, Anna. And now I would like to go to Adrian for him to comment on the result of the polls and if you would like to add any or uh, any other idea. Adrian, please go ahead. No, I, I think I'll just sort of cluster and, and agree with at least so the, the responses I was seeing, they were, they were flashing up a, a little bit quick, <laughs> but, but I mean, there were, there were three sort of types that, that caught my attention. Um, what, one was that there was a comment about, um, you know, protect nature for its beauty. And I'll, I'll just sort of see that as illustrative of the, the fact that, you know, that I agree that there is the need to promote or at least recognize ways of caring for nature, which are not dependent on their market values. And I think that that's one thing we've learned from COVID is that we shouldn't be dependent on market-based instruments as, a, as the sort of sole base or key basis for conservation. Not, not that it's the only one at the moment. Um, the second set sort of clustered around devolution of rights and responsibilities, a more sort of local democratization, to, to put it in, in that way. So, so there are a few comments about um, local consultation and participation and so on. And, and I equally, I think that sort of um, shift in governance, which we have been seeing and we know can be highly effective, um, Pre-COVID and post-COVID, I think it, it is a pathway we should really be be looking into further, and not not seeing that we've already achieved, but seeing that we, we've we've started along it, but have a lot further to go. And then thirdly, there, there were these sort of a few sort of rather what I would see as more fundamental um, changes, which, which will need you know to, to the sort of root causes of the crisis that we face uh, relating to the economy. And, and I'll include in that one about, you know, you, you have to ensure that farmers can, can make a livelihood out of farming. Uh, and that, that, that's related to the, to the global food system and the, the system of agribusiness that, that we live in. And the fact that, you know, many busy, but quite efficient and skilled farmers uh, living in and around protected areas around the world are unable to make a decent living because of the, 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 the price at which they have to sell their food and, and, and other challenges that they're facing. So, so that's one of the fundamentals. Somebody else commented on degrowth. And again, um, you know, honestly, we, we, you know, if we maintain this ubiquitous commitment to economic growth as the primary sort of measure by, by which we, we see social success within states, that, then I am far more pessimistic. I mean, the, the, the figures just, just don't look good. If we take a 3% annual growth as our, what's seen as a sort of standard healthy economy at the moment, you know, in 2050, when we're supposed to have achieved sort of carbon neutrality, that would be a two and a half times growth in our consumption. In 100 years, it will be a 20 times growth in our consumption. And at the same time, you know, this is supposed to be achieved by decoupling, but there, there's some very limited evidence of um, decoupling with regards to fossil fuels from the economy, but none in terms of material consumption. So, so long-term conservation and commitment to economic growth, I, I, I can't see it working. Thank you very much. Uh, now I give the floor to Ina. 
Thank you, Giancarlo, for moderating this part. And thank you for the audience, of course, for their inputs and for Adrian, Herbert and Anna for responding. So we now have a few more minutes left for audience questions and you can still input them in the WUVA chat box if you want to identify yourself and your institutions that we know we, who we are talking with. And actually, my colleague Rebecca has already been very active in the background collecting those questions that already came in there. And thankfully, she channeled them through to me. And so I think I will pick one to start with that um, actually hasn't come up so far in our discussions. And that is somebody from the audience remarks whether the COVID situation might not even play in favor of con uh, to, uh, and tourism's favor. So the question is, um, are severe reductions in tourism uh, not allowing ecosystems and habitats to have a break and recover? Um, you don't have to give long answers to anybody. Maybe Anna is the tourism expert. Please. Um, yeah, I, I actually think we did um, touch on this a little bit earlier, talking about how um, some habitats are recovering. We're seeing, we're seeing um, animals coming out of protected areas onto the streets. We're seeing lions sleeping on the roads of the Kruger National Park. Um, we're seeing canals in Venice clearing, um, dolphins in and whales um, frolicking happily where cruise boats were. Um, so I, I think we are seeing a lot of um, recovery of wildlife. Um, or at least, you know, in the initial, list. but I think we, what we don't have yet is any long-term data. We don't have any proper research. These are all kind of anecdotal reports and things that make good headlines and great photographs um, and they're capturing our attention and we want to see them because we want to hear some good news. Um, so um, I would really like to see um, proper data from the researchers on the ground who are able to get there. So I understand that some protected areas are managing to um, take this break in tourism to actually get out there and do some wildlife monitoring. In other places, it's more difficult. So for example, in the Great Barrier Reef, I understand it's more difficult for people to go and do research because of lockdowns. So um, it'll be interesting in, in the coming months to see what comes out um, from the field in terms of you know, real and long-term benefits to wildlife. And then in turn, how we can use that data to decide how we plan better for the future. Thank you. Great, thank you. And there's another question that kind of boots on that. It relates to conservation and protected area fundings. And I think I will address that to Herbert. This is um, what conservation funding schemes are there that can be implemented during and post COVID? That's, that's a, an interesting question and difficult one to answer. Um, I, I think what we're seeing is, is I mean, I think we, we've discussed the sort of impact of, uh, of tourism and the lack of tourism income. I think we discussed that other parts of protected areas and evaluation of protected areas are actually sort of building resilience within communities. I gave the example of, of Red Plus payments. Um, that, that actually sort of help communities. Um, I, you know, there's a host of initiatives being taken that were, were listed by Anna from, from, from governments and conservation organizations like ourselves uh, to, to bridge the finance. Um, I think what we all know is that's all great and, and, and very useful. I think the longer term issue is how do you actually value um, and so protect nature in, in, for the longer term. How do we actually do that for um, beyond sort of like, you know, just, just reacting to this crisis? And I think one of the things that we've noticed is in the past, a lot of things have been done through ivory tourism, through uh, trust funds, through other means of doing that. And those models are now under serious stress. So rethinking that and whatever way we do it is, is important. Um, our current models are under a lot of, we're fixing the current problem uh, and we probably should at the same time think about sort of what the longer term solution could be and what the longer term alternative could be. Okay, there's one last question that I would like to address to Adrian and maybe, I mean, it's a big question, but if you could point out briefly the one 
impor most important thing. And that's um, how indigenous rights can be reconciled with the establishment of protected areas. Is there just like the one most important recommendation that you would like to give on this? Um, well, I, I think it's, it's about recognizing um, the, the, the systems and the knowledges that indigenous people uh, use for, for managing their territories. Uh, and therefore ensuring, and at the same time, ensuring that territories are not violated. Okay, super. That was super to the point and super um, short. So um, I think this just what we needed at this place. We could continue, but we are running out of time. And so I think we slowly need to come to an end. And um, before we leave the digital room, so to speak, I would just like to let everybody know what um, will be our, the next steps that we will be taking. Of course, you can discuss further, I think, in the Vuva chat box, so you can connect. What we will be doing is that we will be authoring a policy paper that taking up the recommendations coming out of this session, and we want to disseminate this um, among conservation policy experts and hope to have that ready by the end of the year. So if you're interested in that, uh, once it comes out, just drop us a line and we will keep you posted. And then it just reminds, it remains for me to, um, yeah, thank you all. I want to really thank our panelists. Thank you, Anna, Adrian, Herbert. And of course, also thank you, Marcelle, um, our, for your introductory video, for, for all of you, for taking your time, for sharing your insights and, for taking, yeah, really this adventure of a, a online panel discussion with us. And of course, I really also want to, to thank the audience for your polling, for your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't cover all of them, but at least some. And yeah, finally, of course, a huge thank you to Rebecca, who has been in the background and helping us with sorting the questions from the audience out and also to the great GLF team who really did a wonderful job in supporting us from the technical side and making sure everything is running smoothly. And yeah, so it just remains for me to wish you all a very nice day and enjoy the rest of the conference. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye, thank you.